Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, Thursday, June 11th, 2020. I'm your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. Today, we have new science on that giant rock pile in the sky we all love to hate. And I'm talking about the asteroid Bennu. Planetary Science Institute research scientist Jamie Molaro and her collaborators from all across the U.S. have just put out a paper describing how the heating and cooling cycles on Bennu may be responsible for its rock-flinging waves. Now, I could try and explain this paper to you, but I decided instead it would be a lot more interesting to just have Jamie on to explain things in her own words, and she'll be joining us all in just a few moments. But before that, well, we have other news to cover. So let's start out by taking a look at what's happening in the rest of the solar system. Today's top clickbait style headline comes to us from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Wasn't expecting clickbait, it's what we got. They would like you to know that Saturn's moon Titan is moving away from Saturn 100 times faster than previously thought. Based on the questions we're already getting on this story, this news has a lot of people worried about the fate of Titan. Well, folks, 100 times faster than a very small rate is still a pretty small rate. And we'd like you to know that while Titan is on the move, its 11 centimeters per year migration isn't going to affect its fate anytime soon. Titan is just going to keep on orbiting Saturn for billions of years to come. Moon migration is actually nothing new. Our own moon is moving away from the Earth at 3.8 centimeters per year. And this is all related to a whole variety of effects. And the one that we talk about most is the tidal change in energy. As the moon and the Earth interplay, um, our Earth, which is in a perfect sphere, periodically gets slowed down in its rotation. And by periodically, I mean it's constantly getting slowed down in its rotation by the gravitational pull of the moon, which is much smaller and has already been slowed down so that one face is always facing the Earth. Now, with Titan, these same lack of symmetry issues are also causing Titan to migrate. But it turns out things are a lot more complicated than just this, well, energy and tidal effects interplay. So we knew Titan was migrating because it's not perfectly round. We just had misunderstood how fast. Prior estimates were calculated, but this new research is based on analysis of data from Cassini. Specifically, scientists analyzed both radio signals Cassini sent toward Earth during 10 flybys of Titan that took place from 2006 to 2016, and they also measured Titan's place on the sky relative to stars in the background. Now, interactions between the radio waves and Titan could be used in concert with these optical images to give us two different approaches to measuring Titan's position and motion. And all that data together put together one consistent picture of that, well, 100 times faster velocity that we're now seeing. This new result confirms a 2016 paper by Caltech's Jim Fuller that revisited how inner and outer moons can migrate. And, well, that paper determined that outer moons can potentially migrate outward faster than the more simplistic calculation calculations had predicted. With this new analysis of Titan's observed motions, it's possible to work backwards to sort out the evolution of the Saturnian system. As we've brought up before, the exact age and history of Saturn's rings is a matter of a lot of debate, and it remains unclear how old or young or long-lasting the rings might be. This work, published in Nature Astronomy, in a paper led by Valeri Lenny, looks to, well, try and add some new constraints to our understanding. With this new data on Titan, it appears that Titan started its life much closer to Saturn, and its location and that of the rings as a whole expanded much faster than previously thought. Maybe. We still don't have a complete model, and we don't have a time machine to go back and see what happened. So 
like we said, this is just one more clue that will have to be matched as we continue trying to recreate the Saturnian system with software. Now from Saturn, we now turn, well, inward to look at, well, more new data on different moons. This time we're looking at data from Mars Odyssey. 19 years after its arrival at the red planet, this mission is still finding time to do science. And for its latest work, it teamed up with the sun to catch the moon Phobos fully illuminated in December, in eclipse in February and coming out of eclipse in March. These images taken with the Themis camera, which observes in the infrared and captures temperature information, allow scientists to see how quickly Phobos heats up and cools as it orbits in and out of the sun's light. Now under normal conditions, at least one side of Phobos is facing the sun at all times. It just not, might not be the one we're looking at. Um, now this means the world is pretty much always being heated, at least on one side. The exception happens during an eclipse when Phobos can hide in Mars shadow and radiate away any beat up, built up heat and just cool off. The rate at which it cools is determined by its composition and variations in heating and cooling. Well, that represent variations in composition from place to place. The images captured by Themis combined with earlier data showing Phobos during its crescent phases indicates that the 16 kilometer across Phobos is fairly uniform and is made up of a very fine grained material. Nothing exciting really, but sometimes reality isn't exciting. And this 2020, I'll honestly take all not very exciting anything I can get. Unfortunately, our next story, which involves our own planet Earth, does not want to bring a lack of excitement. No, it brings all the excitement. New research published in Geophysical Journal International and led by Corne Kramer finds that areas of Europe we thought were geologically pretty quiet may be hiding a growing magma chamber. Aerial photography of the Eiffel region shows many volcanic features including circular lakes called mares that mark former caldera. The last most recent rather explosive eruption occurred roughly 13,000 years ago and is thought to have resembled Mount Penatuba's 1991 eruption in its size. Now for a long time, we have assumed that areas without ongoing eruptions are probably not experiencing ongoing volcan volcanic activity. Nope. Not the case, not at all. New data that looks at the changing shape of our world indicates that this region is swelling up as something grows beneath the surface. According to Kramer, the results indicate that, rising, that a rising plume could explain the observed patterns and rate of ground movement. This data on changing land elevation and tilt comes from GPS measurements. Additional seismic data also suggest there is magma moving under the Locker Sea. Now, this doesn't mean you should cancel your plans to visit the Eiffel region, although you probably have lots of other reasons given its plague times to not be traveling to France right now. Maybe you should nevertheless give this area of the world a few years before you go visit it. But the volcano, potential volcano, the moving magma, let's go with that. We know that isn't really a concern. Researchers caution, this does not mean that an explosion or earthquake is imminent or even possible again in this area. We and other scientists plan to continue monitoring this area using a variety of geophysical and geochemical techniques. Put another way, yes, there could someday be another eruption. Maybe, maybe. And since we don't know, let's just do more research and find out what's going on under the ground. It's a whole lot more interesting down there. And that rounds up our news for today, but does not end this episode. In just a moment, we will be joined by Dr. Jamie Malaro, and we're gonna be talking about Bennu and its rock flinging ways and the thermodynamics that may make this possible. So stay there, don't go anywhere. 
I will be right back. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I am now ever so very pleased to be joined with my PSI colleague, research scientist, Dr. Jamie Molera. Hello and welcome, Jamie. Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is fun. I, I'm so glad that you are here. Now, you, like so many of us, have spent the past couple of years staring at Bennu. Um, what all was, we're going to start at the beginning. What all first got you involved with Bennu? Well, I am what's called a participating scientist in the project. So I was brought in after the mission had already been launched to work on a specific, uh, area of research, uh, which is, uh, about the mechanical weathering and breakdown of rocks on the surface. Um, so when we arrived at the surface, of course, everybody who's excited about collecting the sample was hoping to find a nice, smooth, you know, dusty surface that would be easy to collect a sample for. But instead, we got a giant pile of rocks. And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so at what at, at what point did did you start to cheer? Because I remember back in, I want to say, December uh as we started to realize this looks like Ryugu, oh God, this looks like Ryugu, um, I started to personally have a very quiet panic because I was expecting Iapetus and we did not get Iapetus. Right. Yeah. No, it is. There were, I think, mixed reactions among the team. You yeah. know, like I said, for my area of research, it was very exciting. Also, but I think in general, for anyone, it is exciting to be the first person, one of the first people that gets to look at pictures of a new world. It's true. And like, it is just, it's really incredible, the feeling of exploration. And so I was there in December when we first arrived and we we're starting to get down our, our first data stream of uh, fairly high resolution images where we could really start to see things on the surface. And we had this really intense week of trying to do some preliminary mapping of all of the biggest features on the surface and, and all of that. And 
just across the board, everyone on the team, it was just excitement all around. There, there was always the existential dread of like, I don't know how we're going to sample this surface, but yes, but you yeah. know, like poking around on the surface, you know, everyone listening, you know, you've, you've looked at images of the surface and, and all of the rocks are different. And like, there's so much like diversity in the objects on the surface and, you know, there's different geological features, different types of rocks and the shape of the asteroid is even unique. And so like, I think I, I can't imagine anyone on the team just not being overwhelmed with excitement at that time, really. I, I was overwhelmed with, oh, my God, I don't want to write the software to map out. Right. <laughs> yeah. So as a, as a programmer, I was, I was just like, oh, this is not the asteroid I ordered. But all right, we'll do this. We'll do <laughs> yeah. this. We can do this. That, yeah. that, I think, was what I told myself for nine months. Um, and we did. We did do this. <laughs> <laughs> But, but so, so you were there with the, with the team and at what point did they realize that Bennu wasn't just way more, uh, tiny Rocky than anyone had anticipated, but was also throwing stuff at the spacecraft? So we discovered that maybe four or five weeks after we kind of first arrived. Um, and it was completely unexpected. We had, so that early December was when kind of we arrived and then kind of early to mid January, um, we had a team meeting to discuss like sort of just everything that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember one of the, you know, science team members just having like an impromptu presentation, like, Hey, I was just in my office and I thought that in this image, like, that these little white dots were just noise, but it turns out they're not. And <laughs> <laughs> there was a mixture of like kind of awe, but also panic because it like, if it is active in a way that we weren't expecting, you know, that could be a danger to the spacecraft. Yeah. So yeah. kind of, there was this kind of simultaneous, like, you know, the panic and excitement kind of work together. And we had to do a whole bunch of things to make sure the spacecraft was safe, decide if we needed to back off, um, you know, things like that. But so we started looking for these particle ejection events, we call them. Um, and uh, they were happening every couple weeks. And it'd be anywhere from, you know, a few to hundreds of small pebbles being, you know, now, when you say every surface. couple of weeks, was it just random or was it related to the periodicity of the thing's rotation or? We don't know yet. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, there is a handful of theories that we are investigating in terms of what could be contributing or, or causing these events. Um, but the the frequency of the events is 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 something we, we really don't understand. Um, they seem to be, there's, there's some that are quite large and have hundreds of particles. Um, the ones that are smaller, maybe only a few or 10 particles or so. Now, how, Those, how big are these particles? Because particles come in a lot, lot of different sizes. Yeah, so they tend to be like millimeters to maybe a couple centimeters. So, so gravel. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're small, but they're not dust. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, so the smaller events were only a, f you know, a few pieces of gravel were being thrown off the surface tend to happen, uh, more commonly than the big events. And, um, so we're just kind of watching the longer we're there, we're watching and keeping track of every time we see this happen and how many particles were ejected and what their sizes were and, all those kinds of things so that we can use all of that information to try and help us figure out what it is that's that's causing this to occur. And we're, we also found that this is a world that is covered in boulders that are cracked and fractured and have smaller rocks next to them and everything is jagged. And while we're used to things being fairly jagged in space because you don't exactly have rain or erosion, this looked even more jagged than I would have expected from looking at moon, Mars, Mercury images. Is yeah. 
there's not a lot of dust is is a, I think a lot of what comes down to is you know on a place like the moon the surface appears very smooth because there's this very fine powdery material mm -hmm. that covers everything but on Bennu you know the biggest things are giant boulders yeah. and then you'd have less giant boulders and then you have smaller boulders and then you have some gravel um but there's there's very little of like the super fine dust to kind of smooth out its appearance. Um, and at first we thought, you know, all of the rocks were the same, uh, but they're also like, they're not the same. So we're finding as, as we're searching on the surface for, you know, we've selected the sampling site now, but as Nine we were searching, crater. yeah. As we were searching, we were looking for all those places where the fine dust might be. Yeah. And we we're noticing that there's color variation and, you know, other kinds of differences in the rocks that, you know, just so much to explore there. Now, the the thing that gets me about this having so many rocks is it's tiny. You could pretty much take Bennu and put it inside of an Olympic village and walk around it if you wanted to. It's what, 600 meters across, I believe? About that. I mean, it'd be kind of expensive to do that, but, you know, we could put in a proposal if you want. It, it's true. Landing it on the earth would be fun <laughs> and it would just collapse into a mound of rocks. Um, so, so when you have a rock, or in this case, a pile of them flying through space that is this small, it doesn't exert a whole lot of gravity. My understanding is that the the if you were to try and stand on the surface of Bennu, which I wouldn't recommend, um, the the force between your feet and the asteroid is similar to the force of a piece of paper held on your hand on Earth, which you can blow on and blow it away. Yeah. So and I, yeah. So how do you create rocks with processes that don't fling the rocks off? the pile well you know i think before we got there we thought that it would be hard to do that yeah we thought what kind of processes would be flinging rocks off of a surface like even if a rock breaks apart you just kind of expect it to stay where it is um but then as we started exploring these different mechanisms like like mechanical weathering or or small impacts hitting the surface we started realizing that you know, as you're saying, it really doesn't take a lot of energy to remove something from the surface. And right. it turns out it's a lot easier than we thought, which also means there's probably a lot more active asteroids than we thought. Yeah. And suddenly we're faced with trying to understand the set of processes that we've never had any experience or, you know, with before, really. Now, um, when, when I, so for full disclosure, I'm an astrophysicist. My research has been on variable stars, but I write software to support people doing all sorts of different science. And, and it's through my journalism and through my software development that I've gotten involved in planetary science. And neither journalism nor software development qualify me to study thermodynamics of asteroids. Full disclosure. Um, now, when I first started going to planetary science meetings, I remember people discussing how do you get a boulder on an asteroid? We were at that point, just how do you get a single boulder? Because it was at that point, people were thinking that it would require impacts, shattering bedrock to create the boulder, but it has to be done at a low enough force that it doesn't get sent off and creamed somewhere else. And, and you're starting to answer not just that question, but how do you get things at all different size scales? And this is where the thermodynamics turns out to be way more important than just collisions. And can you give us that simple thermodynamic primer on just how powerful heating and cooling can be? Yeah, so um, this is a process I usually refer to as like a thermal fracturing. Uh -huh. uh, it is a type of mechanical breakdown of rocks, which is different than like on Earth, we have a lot of chemical processes that involve like rain or biochemistry and, and other kinds of things like 
um, like that. So, so this is a mechanical process. And as the rocks heat and cool, um, that sort of daily going through that cycle of heating and cooling, um, you know, every day for days and days and days, cycles and cycles, um, over time, each cycle that occurs, a tiny little bit of crack propagation can happen. Yeah. Um, and that, that is driven by uh, just the stress that is built up in the rock. You know, it, it heats during the day, so different parts of it expand as they're heating up. And then as it cools, it contracts back down again. And so the stress fields that develop um, as this occurs cause micro cracks to propagate in the rock. And those uh, occur over time very slowly and progressively until eventually they become larger fractures that maybe you could see. And eventually those fractures may break off a piece of rock or, you know, crack a rock in half, creating two boulders instead of one. Um, so this process we know is, is relevant on earth, but it is, there are a lot more processes that are involved with uh, chemical weathering and, and rain and other kinds of things. So, and, and even frost heaves here on Earth often yes. involve like water in the pavement that's aiding and abetting in the expanding and contraction. Yeah. So we have known that that thermal fracturing um, does happen on Earth for a while, but its effects are kind of always intertwined with all of these yeah. other complex processes. So we weren't really sure if we were going to find it on an asteroid. We thought that we would, you know, we had hypothesized that we would, but we had never seen it before. And that was really exciting to be able to say, look, we thought that this happens and it turns out it does. And now we need to understand how does this process influence, you know, all the different boulders on the surface, cause them to change into different sizes, cause them to break apart and create dust and gravel on the surface. Um, and now, how does that process contribute or does that process contribute to ejecting particles from the surface? So, so if I were a boulder on the surface of Bennu, first of all, all of you would be cursing at me and I'm fully aware of that and that's okay. Um, how much heating and cooling would I be experiencing as the asteroid rotated and I got in and out of the sun? Um, maybe depending on where you are, a couple hundred degrees. And that's Celsius? Celsius or Kelvin, yeah, would be the same scale. And so, and, and so a lot. Mm-hmm, quite um, a bit. That, that is more than just going from freezing to boiling. Right. Now, one of the interesting things about the way it works, though, is um, that because its cycle, its daily cycle is only about four and a half hours, mm -hmm. um, when you do heat, it doesn't penetrate very far into the surface because it takes time, you know, for heat to conduct through the surface. And so what we're mostly affecting when um, the, the heating occurs is, is kind of that upper maybe tens of centimeters of these rock surfaces are, are what's most affected by this process. Um, and that causes, it can cause like layers of material to kind of flake off um, in a process we call exfoliation. Um, you know, like you get these like thin shells of, mater of material, like an yeah. onion almost, that kind of flake off the surface. Um, so and essentially the sun is searing and flash freezing the surface <laughs> of these boulders while the core maintains a fairly constant temperature. Yes, although I will say um, it, it's not enough, the heating and cooling is not enough to cause the same kind of effect that like what we would call a thermal shock. Like if you threw a cold piece of glass into a boiling pot of water, it would just shatter and explode, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is um, a much more tame kind of process where you get this slow propagation of cracks instead of very fast. Okay, so, so it's more like forgetting to preheat your stove and turning the pan on, and the second the meat starts to turn brown, you stick it in the refrigerator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so we have the outer and only the outer layers of these boulders that are getting just 
constantly flexed by expansion and contraction and expansion and contraction. And this has got to be bad for their structural integrity. Yes. So um, there's a handful of different ways that the process can cause fractures to develop. Um, as I mentioned before, it can cause uh, surface exfoliation. So it can cause material to kind of get lost off the surface. Um, and it can also cause um, like large fractures to kind of develop through the center of a rock that, you know, maybe might split it in half. Um, and in general, it just kind of makes the, walk, the rock weaker. It causes all of these little cracks to form like, you know, all throughout its volume, you know, again, mostly near the surface, but, um, you know, all those little cracks and pore spaces that are opening up in the rock make it uh, just a lot more weak than, you know, pick up a regular rock on earth and yeah. it'd be pretty hard to break with your hands. But, you know, these are probably fairly weak compared to that. It's, they're just waiting for that one last blow that breaks them completely apart. Yeah, pretty much. Now, with the outer few centimeters of, of the boulders being what is experiencing this exfoliation process, it sounds like it's those outer few centimeters that are going to get exfoliated and crumble off? Well, yeah, so... Um... We expect, you know, we don't expect like a whole flake, like the whole surface of the boulder doesn't flake off at once. It probably breaks apart into small pieces. I hadn't even right, imagined that. Happen. And now I want that to be what happens. All right, continuing on. So that's not what happens. <laughs> it's not what happens. It would no. be qu quite funny. But um, so we probably get the flakes like kind of breaking apart into smaller pieces as this occurs. Right. And, you know, as I mentioned before, the as these cracks propagate, they typically do it slowly, but there comes a time where that crack might get close to the edge of the boulder. And uh, it kind of has this runaway effect where it's like, it's almost there and the, the crack speeds up and, and cracks really quickly just yeah. at the very end. Um, and, and that very end of its lifetime can, cause there, there is enough energy in that event as it happens we think to actually cause the material that is broken off when that happens to be ejected from the surface and we we can use computer models uh, and data from the planet to to simulate this and we can see that like um there is enough energy both to create the crack and to kind of kick it off the surface just gently so, so to put that into different words, when the boulder is intact, that is structurally a higher energy state than to have smaller boulder and little tiny nubbin that breaks off. And the energy difference in creating that nubbin is enough to send that nubbin flying. Yeah, that's one way you could look at it for sure. Um, each, each day as the boulder heats and cools, especially as it heats, it's, it's, it's gaining energy from the sun. Um, and some of that energy is, is what goes into this sort of ejection process. And then when the boulder cools down, it kind of relaxes a little and, and it's like, I'm not so stressed out now. And, you know, kind of quiets down. Um, but when it heats up and it gets all this extra energy from the sun, that's when it's most likely um, to be able to cause this ejection to occur. Now, um, I have an image that you provided that I'm going to ask you to to talk about. This is uh, the first one with the A, B, C, D, E, F, and okay. all the cracks and yellow arrows. So if, if you could discuss this for a moment. Yeah, so these... Um, these are examples of that exfoliation process that I was talking about. You can see in some of the boulders, there's just one, but in some of them, there's these kind of uh, like tiered layers you can almost kind of see. Um, and, and if you were looking at, at the boulder surface sort of flat, this would look like kind of a step down um, as, as parts of those layers, parts of the surface have kind of broken off. Um, so you get these layers that kind of have formed 
and are eroding away from the surfaces. Now, this is kind of amazing that Osiris Rex's amazing imagery of, of Bennu that is allowing us to see these objects that are just centimeters across is effectively letting you capture boulders in the process of getting ready to be evil. So that <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're seeing essentially crack propagation as you look from rock to rock and catch them at various stages in the activity. Yeah, we haven't caught anything sort of actively fracturing on camera yet. Yeah. But certainly, yeah, when we we ha we can see rocks where um, you can see, oh, look, there's a tiny piece of rock at the foot of this boulder that clearly broke off from this place, you know, and, you know, you see those kinds of things all over the surface, um, which is just very cool. We really have never been able to study any world like this before because most of the time we don't have images of this kind of resolution. So like the idea of being able to see everything down to a centimeter scale, uh, like on the moon would be amazing, but we can't unless we go there. Right. Um, yeah. And, and you know, this so is, it's been really cool on better. Th this is that double pronged problem of, of gravity working for and against us. You don't want to stand on Bennu because you're going to just like fling yourself away at, excel at, at escape velocities quite by accident. Um, but with the moon, it's a whole lot harder to orbit that close. And so even with the amazing Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we're looking at best case 20 to 30 centimeters per pixel. Best case. Best, this means yeah. foot football players are three pixels across. Right. Yeah, on Bennu, our 20 to 30 centimeter per pixel images were like the worst ones we had. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> one of our mappers says, did we just imagine all those rectangular rocks? And if not, what's the explanation? So how, how are they sharding things into triangles on Bennu? Yeah. That's a really good observation. And we noticed that right away too. Um, and it's weird, right? You're yeah. like, these are, some of them are, they're so angular and they have this very sort of square, triangular, blocky kind of appearance. And there's some boulders on the surface that are like round and crumbly, Yeah. but, but the angular ones really stand out. And so we think um, that um, some of the fracturing processes yeah, like the, these rocks are, are harder. They have a, a higher strength than the crumbly boulders. And so that probably helps for larger cracks to develop in them. Instead of little bits crumbling off, you probably get, you know, it's more likely for a bigger crack to kind of develop um, through the middle. Um, but a lot of it is going to come down to like what the properties of the mineral are. And we're seeing a lot of effects of like, like layering yeah. In, in some of the, the images of boulders. I don't know if any of your we, mappers we have, have noticed that. It's deeply confusing. Yeah. So, you know, one idea is that um, if you're cr pr trying to propagate a crack and it's near one of these layers, it's naturally going to propagate along a layer because that's, that's going to be the easiest place to go because it's going to be weakest between two layers. Instead of, you know, going through them, you can go like between the layers. Right. Um, and so, you know, that gives us a mechanism for producing boulders that have these like weird flat faces on them um, and other kinds of things like that. So the why the layering exists in the rocks, we don't really know. That has to do with how the rocks were like originally created, um, which is not my area, but I certainly would like to know. So, so to work on, as, as we have 10 minutes left, to work on trying to build up a coherent ish this is all work in progress folks a coherent ish picture of what we understand so far is is Bennu is a a asteroid that at some point in its past got shattered and came back together mm -hmm. it has boulders that have a whole variety of different mineralogies which gives them different colors and we can't explain that yet mm-hmm 
We have boulders that when you see them in profile have what appear to be sedimentary layers. It's not sedimentary, but it's different mineral layers in the rocks. We don't understand that. Right. Different structural layers. They're not necessarily different minerals, but they have right. different textures. Yeah. So, so that could be the same thing, but at different densities, for instance. Yeah. Or it could be composition. Yeah. But we it could be things like density too. Yeah. What we do know is Bennu throws rocks on a semi predict, not predictable on a, every few weeks, you're likely to see it happen once. Mm-hmm. And we think that the reason that we're getting these small things is the heating and cooling on the outskirts of the, the boulder, because it doesn't have time to pro pro propagate into the boulder, is wrecking the structural integrity of the rock and causing pieces to just fall off. And the energies released when the rock gets smaller and the little rock comes off is enough to fling those rocks. Did I sum up everything? Yeah. yeah. I, I will say that that's not our only theory for what's happening. Okay. We have noticed that there, that's one of our two main theories. The other main theory is that it could just be really tiny impacts okay. um, that are hitting the surface and causing this to happen. But we weren't expecting the, like the frequency of yeah. impacts of that, that just that right size to create these tiny little particles off the surface. We weren't expecting that to happen. Now, you know, would, as Hay much, so. would Hayabusa 2 have been able to see the same kind of behavior at Ryugu? Um, we have talked with the team and I think that the, the, a possible reason they didn't was because their, their camera was actually not able to make the oh. same kinds of observations as ours to find these ejections. So we don't know if it was happening or not on Ryugu. Oh no, oh no. Yeah. We'll just have to oh, go no. back. Yeah, it's true, it's true. So we now have a possible theory for how you're getting the tiny rocks. Where are you going from here? What's next up for you for this research? Um, well, uh, I'm pretty excited about, I'm not usually a sample scientist, but yeah. I am excited for when we eventually get the sample back from um, the surface mm -hmm. and we'll be able to really study up close what the properties of these particles are. Like really like what are the individual mineral crystals in these rocks? Uh, what shape are the particles? Yeah. Are they like weird jagged angular things? Are they like cubes? Are they round? You know, and all of those things we can use to study how the fracturing process occurs because it gives us more information about what the cracks were like and what the original boulders were like. So that is going to be pretty exciting when we have that information. And, and that kind of information will allow you to get at things like um, as, as a you understand what grains are made of you can recreate you can you can do like we do with the moon and you can start making fake rocks to do mm -hmm. things to that you would never do with the actual samples yeah and we can measure the property like the thermal properties and the mechanical properties of the actual samples and yeah there's a lot and and we're going to be here to talk to you about all of this as the future papers come out and we can't wait to learn more. Now, if folks could know any one thing about the research that you've been doing, like if they only remember one thing from today, what is the one thing that you want everyone to remember? Um, I guess the one thing is just to think about, we use the word weathering a lot on earth, but it yeah. turns out you don't need weather to cause rocks to break down. And so, you know, it really, this heating and cooling process can cause these really cool fractures to form and it's going to happen differently on all different kinds of worlds. And, you know, I can't wait to, to study them all. That, that sounds absolutely amazing. And your paper appears now in the journal Nature and um, Nature Communications, Nature yeah. Communications. Sorry. Thank you for the correction. And, um, 
we can't wait to see all the subsequent work coming from this and for, um, well, all the rest of your research. Now, we have coming up on October 20th, the sample being taken from Nightingale Crater from by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. Do you know where you're going to be on October 20th? Well, I mean, in, in these pandemic times, I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen. I am not, I don't do any of the engineering work on the team. So I'm not particularly critical to actually yeah. collecting the sample. So I will probably be at home if I can be um, at the University of Arizona with the rest of the team when they're doing this, I absolutely will be, but we'll have to see. Well, I hope if you can't be there that you have a private Zoom in to everyone in the control center so you can, well, at least digitally be there. We yeah. will be right here on twitch.tv bringing everything that we can to everyone out there live. Um, so we have a couple of questions that I want to try and get to before we round everything out. Um, the first one is, is there ice too? Do we have ice that we've been able to detect? So we have not found any ice. We do think that there is some water molecules that are kind of bound up within the minerals of the rocks, but we have not observed any like, like solid ice deposits, um, or, or anything like that, like we have found on the moon or anything. With, with, and then one final question. With the exfoliation, can we actually start to get at hints of differences between this rock's mineral structure versus that one's based on the size of the chunks falling off of them? Yeah, that can tell us a lot. Uh, we can use the models, you know, talking about the computer modeling and, and again with the mineralogy information that we'll get from the samples, we'll be able to tell a lot from analyzing the sort of what we call the size frequency distribution of the chunks, the sizes of all the different chunks that are produced as a result of the fracturing process. Uh, will give us a lot of information about how it occurs. And then we can look at rock of different colors and see how they're different, how they fracture differently, or rocks of different textures and see how they fracture differently. Um, so it'll really be a whole lot of data that we'll have to be able to explore. And, and we can't wait to learn more. I know one of the passions of our group is what are all those little tiny shiny bits? And um, we can't wait to see all the future papers. But for now, I need to let you go. Thank you so much for being with us, Jamie. This has been absolutely amazing. And I'm so yeah, glad. Thanks for having me. And um, we'll bring you back when your next big paper comes out. Thank Looking you. Looking forward to it. And um, to everyone out there, thank you for being here. And um, this has been The Daily Space. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay, and um, I was your host for today and wrote today's episode in which I was joined by Dr. Jamie Malero as our guest. Um, this episode will be engineered by Ali Pelfrey, and our web content will be produced by Beth Johnson. Everything that we do is a product of the Planetary Science Institute a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. We are here thanks to the generous contributions and volunteer efforts of people just like you. We are here because you help. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you, our instro. I think I actually have a dog cam. I do. I don't know if I have a dog, though. Do I have a dog? Yes, I have a dog as well. Okay, so I also saw that there were some subs that came in. Um, and the dog ever so slowly ambles over. That is Malachi. Um, so thank you, Wayne Johnson, for giving Raj Lutha. Luth thank you for giving Raj the sub. And thank you for the bits. And thank you all for being here. We are currently... Um, I, I ran the budgets on Monday... And I can see that folks are struggling right now. Our donations are down. And um, I hope everyone's doing okay out there. And this is a, a, a way of saying, I see you, we care, and your volunteer efforts matter to us just as much 
as everything you do with your bits and your subs, although your bits and your subs, let me pay Beth and Allie. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kirov. Thank you. Do you want this, Malachi? Do you want this? You do. There you go. Um, so, so I hope you're okay. Check in over on Discord and we're here for you guys during plague times, riot times, murder hornets, murder hornets. That's where 2020 has taken us. So we're here for you. But I'm going to go join you over on the Discord in a few minutes. And for now, this stream needs to come to an end, um, mostly so I can record the audio for the podcast. So um, who do you feel like raiding today? Um, this is me looking at my other screen. So I am seeing that EJ is, has zero viewers. Twitch must be glitching. Um, do you want to raid EJ? Do you have someone else you want to raid? Oh, bother is up. Okay. So my software is just not updating. Let's go raid. Oh, bother. Oh, Dr. Aaron Mack is streaming. Hold on. Hold on. Let me go looking. Oh, she is. Well, she's streaming Mass Effect. Um, let's, let's stream. Okay, fine. I will stream Dr. Aaron Mack. She is fabulous. You can go watch Mass Effect. Um, she's a PhD astrophysicist. She worked on, um, some really cool discoveries involving, uh, gravitational waves. Um, and she's just a good human. She also works on Star Trek periodically, which makes her like really amazing. Um, so go say hi, go say hi, but for now, be safe, everyone be safe and have as good a morning, evening or afternoon as you can wear a mask. If you go outside and please, please wash your hands. I will see you all later. Bye-bye.